This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. We're delighted to uh, have you with us again for the Technology Management Program Lecture Series. We uh, are very fortunate this evening to have with us a guest from uh, many years' service at uh, Intel Corp. And uh, Ted Jenkins, thanks for making the trip down. And uh, I know you've got some stories that uh, will be most relevant for uh, some of our young scientists, engineers, and uh, business econ students and comm students to uh, look at as they plan their careers. As we go through the discussion at the uh, end, we will have uh, Q&A, and uh, please wait for the mic on either side so we can capture your questions for uh, TV. Ted Jenkins, thanks for joining us. Okay. Battery check. Yeah. Okay. You know, half the problems with any kind of electronics is usually in the power supply, so it's been my experience anyway. Um, I haven't done many case studies, but uh, I actually lived through this one, and I think this, I think this might be interesting to you. There were some uh, interesting lessons. Uh, how did a bunch of engineers starting a company um, figure out how to ultimately manage it is sort of the question that we're going to answer here. Um, uh, I think it was in my bio, but I'll just tell you, I started at Intel in September of 68. The company was founded in July of 1968, and uh, I was uh, employee number 22 um, and uh, uh, did the whole ride and actually retired about 10 years ago, so I can't bring you completely up to date, I can bring you up to what it was like 10 years ago, but I think that's kind of when the stock peaked, and so uh, maybe that's all we're interested in as a joke. But <laughs> um, so in today's topics, I thought I'd tell you um, how, we, how we started. What, what, what sort of raw material did we, did we begin with? Um, you know, we weren't, from a management standpoint, we weren't really quite at ground zero. We didn't know that, but... Um, but uh, there were things that we did as engineers which were pretty constructive, I thought. Um, and as we went forward, then we began acquiring knowledge. Uh, we, uh, I'll hit this point a couple of times in the presentation, but uh, as you know, the company was started by Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce, and that Gordon Moore is the Moore of Moore's Law. And he actually did that before he got to Intel, so it's... Uh, and. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's still going today, so that was a pretty good one. But he and Bob Noyce were two of the eight founders of, uh, of Fairchild Semiconductor, which started in 57, uh, just recently had its 50th anniversary. Uh, Intel just had its 40th. And uh, the company was run, was a subsidiary of a company back east. They wanted to run their own company, so they started their own. They, had, they were the most senior people that we had from an experience standpoint. Uh, number of the people came from Fairchild R&D. Andy Grove, very uh, uh, hard-edged, 
a uh, very smart guy uh, who was VP of operations and basically running, you know, the most of the company that needed to, uh, needed uh, management uh, capability. And so we'll talk about him. But uh, since we didn't know everything, there was actually a, an orientation to acquire knowledge. I'll talk about that and how we did that. And also how we came to the idea of becoming a learning organization, which I, th I think is very important for any organization. We'll talk about what that means. And then the, what happens in terms of ultimately coming to a culture, what, what a business culture is and, uh, and uh, how we developed that, reinforced that, propagated that, and why we did it. Um, and then some final, some final thoughts uh, about, um, you know, sort of what, is all this, what does all this mean? So the, in the starting material, I'm going to use a, this is sort of the differential equation analogy. We're going to talk about the initial conditions and the trajectory, and then maybe we can project how we go forward here. A number of us were um, uh, basically Fairchild Semiconductor Engineers. The research and development lab is where Andy came from. It's where I worked. It's where uh, some of our other ultimate uh, VPs came from. We were sensitive about draining that company, so we made a strong effort to actually include some other people from other, other companies. Uh, but it really had this really had this flavor because Bob Noyce had been the general manager of that division. Gordon Moore had been head of R&D, and Andy Grove had run a, a major fraction of the lab as well. And then n numerous others of us worked there. So we were semiconductor engineers. The interesting thing was, um, since we were from an R&D facility, we were pretty data intensive. We kept a lot of indicators. Um, that was pretty good news. Now these are technical indicators, these are not business indicators, but at least we had that, we had that ethic and it, uh, it was an important uh, starting point. We're probably very short on management theory. I don't know anybody that had any psychology. If you talked about, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I, w I was amazed when I went and heard about Maslow's hierarchy of psychological needs. I mean, maybe all of you have had all of that stuff uh, uh, in the more modern uh, education period here, but that that stuff was relatively newer. We were only about 10 years, you know, behind when that was put together. Now there's a much longer period of time, and some of these things become more tried and true as time goes on. So, but we were we were uh, short on that. We were, you know, kind of do it because I said so sort of uh, sort of thing. I think we had. Um, pretty solid, and I'm talking about personal values here. Uh, you know, these are real people. They had worked in, uh, again, in research. They were used to publishing papers. You know, there's the honesty issue. There's the references. There's the, you know, the issue of, you know, were you first or weren't you first? Uh, uh, num numerous people had been involved in filing patents, so they, they knew about that uh, ethic. And, and so those, those parts were were part of our overall persona, but um, in terms of uh, I, when I say incomplete, uh, you know, since we were rel relatively smaller groups, I don't know that uh, you know teamwork processes, for example, teamwork uh, ethics, uh, or or really solid uh, interpersonal uh, uh, values. Uh, I, I would let's let's just say I think they were healthy, but they were probably quite variable throughout the organization. Uh, we did have pretty healthy and professional uh, interpersonal relationships. Um, you know, this group uh, uh, socialized together. They had fun. They, um, you know, they did those things. So, so that's that stuff was okay. So this is this is kind of uh, the the thing that we that we had to uh, start with. And we were in the old uh, Union Carbide building. We, you know, we had the equipment. I think, and this was in the days of. Uh, two-inch wafers, which were big ones for us in those days, and as compared with 12-inch wafer, silicon wafers today. Um, the, uh, the plan was, um, I don't have any other foils on this, but the plan was ultimately to be a major semiconductor, uh, you know, broad product line, and we were starting with, uh, with uh, semiconductor memory. The, uh, the first two products, 
that the first we and we were going to do MOS and bipolar technology. So the first two were um, the the MOS product was a 256 bit, not no K's, megs, nothing in there, and the <laughs> the bipolar product was a 64 bit. Uh, that's, I worked on the bipolar product. It was fast, though. The bipolar product was 35 nanoseconds, so we felt uh, not too bad, but not very many bits. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that, and, and keep in mind, I'm going to tell a number of stories that tells us just how this whole management thing built up. It's not going to be necessarily as orderly as you might think. One of the first things that we did was one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, these, these ended up being very useful and I think in a lot of ways might have been a culture that persisted Intel and it's a very strong piece of how the organization runs and how supervisors deal with managers, these er, deal with uh, their subordinates. And this, this can be anywhere from uh, once a week if the person's not particularly experienced or a mature level. Uh, you know, first line person, uh, a supervisor, an engineering manager would meet with his subordinates once a week, ultimately once this got going. We didn't have this in the beginning, and it started as, um, and you know, it was actually a piece of it, it started as a chance meeting in the hall with your supervisor. You know, you'd, you'd be on your way to the wherever, and you'd, uh, you were out of the lab, and you'd run into your boss, and he'd say, well, how's it going on this? Well, you'd say, well, it's pretty good, and then so he'd drill down for a little higher level of detail, and, uh, and then you'd say, well, wait a minute, I've got to go back to my uh, office and get my data. So you go back and get your data, and then you bring it out and start talking about it, and then there'd be another question or something. Oh, well, let me go get that. And finally, <coughs> we, said, we said, why don't we just, let's, forget about it. Let's just schedule a meeting. Let's just do this periodically, and I'll update you, and, uh, and we'll do it in the, in, the course of this, in the course of this meeting. So we said, let's prepare and schedule one-on-one -on -one meeting. And... Um, the goal here was to have this be employee-led. The employee would actually uh, get together all of the results, plans that are going, and then sit down with the boss and, and talk about it. And if there were questions or whatever, the boss could you know, contribute to what the plan was for the incremental work, and that would factor in with whatever it was, whether it was developing a new process or whether it was uh, just simply improving the yield on a current one, um, this is the thing that we began doing, and it just, uh, it just started uh, working very well. Before this, we'd do monthly progress reports. We had done those before. Those, were, um, those would actually come back, and um, sometimes Andy would edit them. He would read them all before it was published because it was going out under his name. But this, this, these one-on-one these -on -one meetings ended up being a, an early fixture of... Uh, of Intel, and it uh, it really went on and on and on. And as as uh, as as you got more and more senior, the frequency might go down. I would get, I think, in my last assignment as a VP, I would meet with my boss formally about once a month. Actually, we had the kind of business where if I had something happen, he always got there before eight o'clock. So did I. So I would just swing by and say da 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 da, you know, and then. If he wanted to give me any advice, we would move on. So there was, there was that sort of uh, quick response sort of discussion, but this was the real formal thing, and it all, it all started once upon a time, and um, this ended up being a very powerful part of, of how Intel kept itself uh, organized. Um, the, uh, the other thing was uh, that we got to was importing knowledge. You know, early methodology was uh, to do this. Uh, Andy Grove and the guy he hired to do QA really didn't, hadn't run a QA organization, really didn't know anything about it. So they got a consultant and they got training. That he and his guy that did this got training. They're both good scientists, both good engineers, and uh, they went to conferences. And uh, as time went on, we built up our own QA ethic and reliability and uh, uh, and uh, got this whole thing running. And basically, we just applied that same methodology to uh, uh, management training. And we always evaluated what we heard on utility. We didn't, <laughs> Andy Grove wouldn't take everything at face value and, uh, and the rest of us wouldn't either. We would just 
see what seemed to resonate and would be effective for us, and then do that. So um, the first one, I was involved in one of the first instances of these, which was a, a management conference on motivation. Uh, I did the, was by yours truly. And this was one of these things where we did it one riot, one ranger. I went to the conference. I took all the notes and everything else, and, I, and then I had to come back and teach it to the rest of the group. And it included these things like Maslow's Hierarch of Psychological Need, Peter Drucker's Management by Objectives. I probably should have spelled that out for you. Uh, Douglas McGregor's Theory X, Theory Y, Frederick Hertzberg's Job Satisfiers and Dissatisfiers. Um, stuff that was really, I mean, all of this stuff was completely new to me. Um, and one of the things that... Um, that we ended up uh, really picking up on was the management by objectives because we were already so indicator sensitive that we could become, um, that we would start using these indicators for planning. You know, if you're tracking the yield, well, what's the yield going to be in a quarter? You know, I have no idea. Well, if you don't try to forecast it and if you don't track it with that in mind, you'll never know. But so that's what we, that's what we ultimately ended up doing and it, uh, and it became uh, very, uh, very effective. Um, uh, we actually had, later on, we actually had a whole uh, off-site uh, meeting with Peter Drucker. Uh, he was a very old man by the time we did that, and uh, Andy also liked what he said about uh, entrepreneur, which he said was, it's that individual that waits for business or that seizes on business dynamics to reallocate resources to more productive ends. So you know, this stuff that's going on around us, yes, it can be kind of scary, but there's certainly some <laughs> dynamics out there. And, you know, there's a few entrepreneurs out there looking to see what they could do more productively from here on forward. Um, this sort of morphed, this sort of evolved into our becoming what I would call a learning organization. Um, Andy sees the value. We start having operations reviews. He heard other companies had done this. This is where Somebody stands up and explains what his organization is doing. Chance to ask questions, ask questions about problems. Uh, you know, not everything gets resolved, but you, you soon you get to the idea that uh, the organization is, uh, is a, a learning organization and you're going to acquire new skills. One of the things that uh, we came up with, a minor thing here, but I just mentioned it that got propagated at one of these was, okay, we have all these memos flying around and is the you know, as you, <laughs> it goes up non-linearly with the number of people we have, and pretty soon you've got a wad of paper like this. You know, how do you deal with this? And he, he charged the authors with the idea of classifying all of these memos for the distribution list as action required, important information, or background information. So you could look at the top of the memo and see, is this something where you had some work to do? You had a, a, a something that was due on a certain date, or it was just important for you, or this was just for information? This was just background information for you. No action required probably wouldn't have a big impact on your organization, so that you could prioritize the time that you spent on dealing with those, with those, uh, with all that paperwork. And then we <coughs> we evolved further on into what I would call group retreats for senior managers. It didn't ha always have to be senior managers. It could be a functionality or whatever. Uh, you know, sometimes this would be a Friday or a half a Friday and a Saturday or something like that. Um, but a group of managers would go off-site for some focused and new learning from a management consultant. Uh, these were probably at an interval of one year to one half year, something like that. We would basically try out these ideas and then uh, uh, we would keep and implement those that had the highest utilities and uh, discard others. At this point, um, the corporate culture was beginning to be uh, formed. And uh, I don't actually have a, a, a foil on this, but when you talk about culture, uh, um, a group culture or a culture for an organization, in my mind, this is a set of shared values that ideally are completely understood so that you know that uh, when you do something you can expect a certain response or if you've got certain information or certain set of circumstances 
everybody, can, everybody knows what to expect uh, that you're going to do. And to the extent that you can sort of get this um, uh, unwritten, well, it has to be written at some point, but it's this understood operating system there, you know, you gain that much more value that you just don't have to talk about or negotiate or, or um, essentially impel people to do. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. And then we began <clears throat> developing our own internal courses. We actually got a training organization, um, and uh, they would, uh, the training organization was really more to handle the uh, administration of the training materials and uh, the consultants that we were going to use as opposed to actually do the training. They would assist in putting the courses together, but most of these were put together by line management, people that had an interest in training or an interest in management, and they would uh, actually um, do them, and we would do them based on the best uh, acquired principles and lessons. And uh, we felt they were more effective if we had line managers as instructors. One example, though, that we put a lot of effort into, which was kind of, um, you know, you might think it's really mundane, but um, our meetings course. We have a course that takes about two-thirds or three-fourths of a day on how to run a meeting. We actually had three prototypes before we got to the, to the final version of this. I mean, if you think about this, how many crappy meetings have you been in in your life where, you know, nothing happens or anything else? We finally got one that, um, and Bill Daniels is the guy who did it. He actually has a little, thin little book you can get which says it, and there's a couple of great ideas in there, and I, you know, I'm not going to teach the meetings course, but one of those is, you know, design your meeting, figure out what it's for, what you want to have happen, what you, do, what you want the outcome to be, who has to be there, who doesn't have to be there, and run it that way and, uh, you know, start all your meetings on time. Um, uh, as, a, as a matter of protocol here, I'm going to be a little self-critical. We didn't get our meeting started until, thir until eight minutes past the half hour. And uh, I'm told that there's 125 people in here. That comes out to 100 man hours in my book, uh, you know, our 100... Or no, I guess that's a uh, thousand uh, man minutes, and you know that's that's a that's a hell of a that's a hell of a big expense. Um, you know, you'll you'll find out that, uh, in, and if you don't start your meeting on times, people won't on time. People won't come on time. Oh, so there's there are some good good things that learn that can really help some overall productivity and effectiveness. And it's not just starting your meeting on time. It's just okay. What are we going to do? make a decision, let's uh, do something, whatever, and, uh, and then uh, shut the meeting down. Uh, you know, these, uh, probably the worst offense are the weekly scheduled staff meeting where you get together and, well, okay, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? It's a waste of time. Design your meeting, figure out what you want done. Um, this was in a condition, the environment was very rapid sales growth. Um, we were turning the crank on Moore's Law, which uh, says that you can double the electronic complexity every 18 months. And that's driven really by the fact that the dimensions on the circuits that we were building got smaller and smaller and smaller. The narrowest line that we could make when I started at Intel was 10 microns. Now they're down to 25 nanometers or something like that. We're talking about <clears throat> almost a factor of, uh, of 1,000 uh, linear in 40 years, you get to square that because the chip is square. You know, you're talking about area. You know, we're talking <laughs> we're talking about a factor of a million in uh, in size compression over the over the lifetime of that industry. So you know, this this is what's allowed us to make things cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and higher and higher complexity. Um, we got to the point because we we're growing so fast. We had a policy to hire 75 percent of the uh, exempts as new college graduates. And the advantage was you get to look at the whole uh, capability spectrum. You got to see the best students, the worst students. Sometimes the best students would get gobbled up, you know, uh, uh, if you were trying to hire from other people in industry and you only got the ones that were looking for jobs. And a lot of times those weren't the best. You also got malleable employees, employees that you could uh, challenge who didn't know what they couldn't do 
and uh, could be very effective. And we also got into geographical diversification and we're running plants at, uh, you know, Phoenix and uh, Albuquerque uh, and uh, Portland, several places in Portland. In our course list, I've already mentioned the meetings one. These are, these are the higher powered ones that we did, management by objectives uh, with Peter Drucker, who actually invented that in the 50s, um, which is, uh, you know, a great uh, course that uh, deals with uh, what starts with your charter. Uh, actually, what you do is you start with a charter of the entire company what the objectives are, what the key results are going to be. We did it on a quarterly basis. Uh, sometimes for st strategy, you can go longer than that. And then we would look at them at the end of the quarter and, and track them monthly throughout. One of the things that you get when you do that, and every exempt had these, <coughs> and what that did was it meant that you were very tightly linked with the purpose of the entire corporation. You knew exactly what your role was in the corporation. You knew what your particular indicators uh, were that you were going, or your your uh, your job was to get certain things done. Um, we would track we would track these through. It was a great communication tool. It was a great alignment tool. And the other thing that happens, individuals will take on more aggressive goals than you can assign them. Most people will look at it and actually take something. And if you get something that has about these, if these are about 80 percent chance of success, um, you really do get people working very hard and focused on, on, you know, what really everybody needs to be done. Another one of my favorite courses was Situational Leadership. That was a management retreat with Hershey. This was a Hershey and Blanchard book on, on organizational behavior, which basically talks about, depending on the task-relevant maturity of the follower, there is, a, 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 there is an optimum um, effectiveness uh, in a particular management style. And those vary. If somebody's very high, very, I'll just tell you very quickly, the, the lowest task relevant maturity is telling what to do, how to do, and why. The next one is selling, which is what to do, how to do, and uh, why. Or what did, I, did I say that for the first one? The first one was just what to do, how to do, and when to do it. The next one was what to do, it, how to do it, when to do it, and why. The next one was you ask the employee, okay, what do you, what's your plan? And then you comment on it. And the last one is just delegate. The person's got all the, you know, you've got complete trust in them and you don't spend a lot of time working it. You just let them do it. But that ended up being a tremendous aha and it, and it really does work. Um, but those were the major courses. There were other courses which we also had for, and I, I'm not going to explain these to you, but I think they make sense. You know, performance review, strategic planning, actually one on decision making. Um, some of this stuff sounds like we started managing by cliche, which is not what, you do, not what you do, but usually there's a little saying that comes out of a lot of these, and one that we developed was disagree and commit, um, you know, because then if you're all running in the same direction, you can find out it's the wrong direction if it is. Uh, we had one on supervision, uh, frontline for factories, negotiations, uh, project management, especially for the engineering organizations, and then total quality management, that came along later. Actually, that had a lot to do with um, uh, what had what drove that into uh, us was Hewlett Packard wrote this article saying how much lower the incoming defect density was in the Japanese DRAMs than ours, and that put a big jolt into the whole semiconductor industry and got us started on that and. Was a was a was a very was a very good uh, 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 thing for us to do. Um, the other one is uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about refining values, and this is how you uh, really build and articulate a culture. This was sort of the last evolution um, at Intel uh, because uh, we. We began thinking about it. Well, what is the culture? What is the corporate culture? What's important? What if, and and you, it doesn't make sense to try and do this from ground zero. You've got to sort of find your way. And uh, I think if you uh, work hard at it or a certain experimental to a certain extent, you find out what the more important issues are in the kind of business that you're running, and then you can uh, work with that and refine it. But it sort of comes out of the 
who we are, what we do, how we do it. Uh, and uh, once you get to a certain point, you articulate that culture, talk about the common values, you talk about the most useful values, and once you get that going, and this is not something that's static, <clears throat> as you move along, you can actually change and develop and morph this and refine it, but uh, uh, it is, it is, it, it can't move a lot because you, you want to, you want to have some common reference that you can use, but uh, it's, uh, it's very useful in uh, training uh, new hires and orienting new hires and longer term employees. And then, of course, you, as I said, you refine and modify this culture as the, um, as the organization uh, grows and goes forward. I think what we did at Intel from a procedural stand, uh, standpoint was more an outgrowth of how uh, Andy Grove and his own values uh, uh, became a part of that. He was a very, very strong individual. Um, actually, Hungarian, he came here out of Hungary in the, in the 50s like a number of other people. His uh, early dicta or the things that he um, impressed on us was, you know, do what you say you're going to do. You know, basically um, have, that, have that work. And his, for himself, he insisted, he imposed on himself a less than 24-hour response time for telephone, mail, email, that sort of thing. Um, you know, if he felt that if there was, that was a long time, it would, um, it would uh, be a drag on the effectiveness of the whole team. Uh, all of the decisions were science and data-based. Um, you know, there could be some emotion, but we tried to dial that out of everything and sort of get to some uh, common uh, thing. You know, what's going to make us the most money? What's going to make the most reliable product? What's the, you know, what are the pros and cons of the issues that? He also had respect for the team. His whole issue was trying to uh, figure out how to make the team as effective and as productive as possible. And it was direct communication. He would say, we don't hide our problems. We, under a rug, we get them out, we <laughs> glorify them, and we solve them. So, um, you know, if he thought you had some issues, you would certainly hear about it. And we actually, if you remember the earlier slide, we actually had a, a slide on, uh, actually had a course on constructive confrontation, which tells you how to do that, how to how to confront issues where there are differences between you and your coworkers, and how to do that in a way that allows you to get a solution and go forward and stay professional. So I, I was uh, going to go uh, spend a little bit of time here and then we'll get into some questions on, I thought I would tell you where this took us uh, in terms of the uh, Intel culture and um, and what it was. And actually, I forgot to get a couple of things out, but I will I will do that. These are just a couple of small little props that I that I brought along. Um, meanwhile, you can you can be looking at the uh, at the Intel mission, and that's uh, sort of what we use for our key results. This is a little bit into and our objectives. This is a little bit independent of what the values are, but this is the Intel culture, and I will show you something that this is, <clears throat> I don't know whether it's my last badge, but it's one of them. There's a, there's a bunch of crap here that I used to carry on my, <laughs> on my shirt. Two of these, two of these tags were just uh, for property passes, and I used to carry those in my wallet. They weren't here. I just put them for safe sake. But I, I did have, um, th this was a calendar, and then on the back, it, it had the mission and values. And so this was something that, at least at this point in time, virtually every um, employee carried and, and had, uh, you know, close to their heart, so to speak. But I'll go through this quickly. This was, um, these are the elements of the Intel culture. Customer orientation, discipline, quality, risk-taking, great place to work and results orientation or output orientation. And they were broken down like this. This is the customer orientation. Um, 
you know, listen and respond. I don't think I have to read all of these to you, but uh, communications about expectations and mutual intentions is important. Um, deliver innovative products, make it easy to work for us, be vendor of choice. That was the quality uh, uh, tagline at the, at the point in time uh, as a part of the total quality management. In discipline, uncompromising integrity and professionalism. Safe and injury-free work, injury workplace, make and meet commitments. You see how this, these track, especially the discipline and the, uh, and the, uh, um, and getting things done relate back to Grove. Make and meet commitments, plan, fund, and staff projects. Don't give somebody a job without the resources. Pay attention to detail. Uh, quality, standards of excellence. Do the right things right. Do it right the first time. Continuously learn, develop, and improve. Take pride in our work. Risk taking, and this is this is in uh, deference to the entrepreneurial aspect of our business. But foster innovation and creative thinking. Embrace change and challenge the status quo. Listen to ideas and viewpoints. Learn from our successes and mistakes. Encourage and reward informed risk taking. That doesn't, so if somebody, back up here, if somebody takes a risk and fail, you're allowed to fail. Doesn't mean you're gonna get to the top of the company by failing, but if we ask somebody to, to work on a very hard job, we know that there's a prob some, sort, some probability that it might not work out well. You know, we don't, um, you know, pillar that guy just because uh, he happened to take on a very difficult job. Um, great place to work. Be open and direct. Again, Andy Grove, extremely direct. <laughs> Promote a uh, challenging work environment that develops our workforce. Work as a team, respect and trust for each other, recognize and reward accomplishments. That was very important. Um, manage performance fairly and firmly, equitably. Be an asset in our communities. That's something we added later on. Results orientation, output orientation. This is something that uh, was with the company forever, set challenging and competitive goals, focus on the output. Assume responsibility. If there's a gap between the organizations, something falls in the gap, it was uh, individual's responsibility to go and actually um, maybe take something beyond their charter to make sure that it uh, was handled until it could be properly um, uh, put to the appropriate place. Constructively confront and solve problems, execute flawlessly. A lot of times in the history of the company, they did not have the best product, but we did do the best job of delivering it and selling it so that, um, you know, we got the business anyway, not, maybe not at the, at, the high, at the highest level, but in general. So as I look back and try and um, uh, aggregate what were the most important things, I really think that our morphing into a learning organization was very critical. And, you know, importing the best practices, devoting a strategic fraction of the time that you're working there for learning, uh, saying that it's okay and building it into the job and involving line management were pretty effective. You know, now what's the right amount of time? I don't think you ought to spend more than 5% of your time. Oh, it depends. I mean, obviously, there, there could be periods in time where maybe it has to be higher, but on an ongoing basis, maybe a few percent of the, of the time of all the employees learning. That says, you know, maybe take a course every six months or, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a day every three months or something like that. That, that to me, is, is a good number, and I think there's, I think there's enough material new to learn and old to refresh that uh, that time can be very well used. One thing that you notice when you go to one of these courses is it sort of recharges your um, batteries. You, you feel uh, more like taking things on and it gives you a little different perspective and you, it's energizing. Um, so, you know, yes, it costs you some time, but maybe in the grand scheme of things, you get that back and more, especially if it relates to the effectiveness of the entire team. Nurture the cultural dynamics. Uh, you know, articulate your culture. Orient new employees. Reevaluate re and refine and keep that current, keep it relevant. That's critical. 
And then I'm going to come back to one final thing, which um, you know is something as you are thinking about your vocational transition, which you know is probably not this year, but maybe it's next year, or the year after that. I certainly hope you're thinking about it. Um, but a good, being a good manager starts with healthy personal values. And I take an expanded view of integrity here, which I claim should involve a complete internal consistency in what you say, what you think, and what you do. Basically, you have to walk the talk. Another cliche, sorry, um, but it's, it's one that's easy to remember. Treat all levels of employees with respect. You know, don't treat the, don't treat the um, uh, VP with uh, kid gloves and uh, be a jerk to the um, janitor or uh, administrative assistant or something like that. Honesty, equity, uh, make a contribution, work hard, stay off the critical, critical path. Um, you know, there's probably others, there's probably different ways of saying this, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, if you don't have this uh, integrity and consistency, your employees or your colleagues or your boss will decode you. Your employees will decode you faster than ever else, and they won't trust you, and they won't perform for you like they will if they know that you're subjecting yourself to everything that you're asking them to do and you're role modeling the best behaviors there. So that's my parting shot. And um, thank you. Good luck with your careers. And now I'm ready for some questions and discussion. So as I look into the light here, there must does somebody have a question? We have a microphone over here and a microphone down here. There's a question here. Whoops, maybe that's not. Yeah, I think I had uh, two questions. One was, uh, how long after the company started, and also how, how large was the company um, when this occurred, was it that you started recognizing the need to have these uh, internal courses? I think it was about three years, something like that. Oh, that soon. Yeah, it was, it was pretty soon. I, I mean, I was, quite frankly, I was really a little bit surprised when they asked me to take on this assignment. I was... I had been a new manager. I was supervising some engineers, and um, it was uh, was kind of a surprise to me, and it was a little a little threatening <laughs> to come back and present to this group. And so, well, I, as a follow up, um, uh, it, it seems that seems kind of I was surprised that it's that soon for a startup company. And did you, as a startup company, have to commit a large amount of resources, like financial resources, to Organizing these company, uh, these these. No, see, no. See, because it started as what 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 they lost was two days of my time and the cost of the seminar, and so I went and then I came back and that that was why we did it one riot one ranger as we started. So, it, you know, it started like that, and then as we went on, you know, somebody says, "Hey, I know a consultant that can do such and such and such and such, and why don't we just have them come and train everybody at once?" So we said, "Okay, well, we'll take part of a Friday and a Saturday and." you know, do it, do it that way, and it, and it kind of morphed. And then I would say our first instance of the culture was maybe, God, I hope I don't get this, maybe 15 years into the company we, that, that we first kind of began thinking about, you know, that and, 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 and uh, reinforcing and propagating that. Uh, and the second question I had was, um, it, as, a, as a, a technical or more of a research uh, type of company. It, from wh what you're saying, it sounds like you're fairly strict. It's like, um, do you not encourage, or or at the time when you were there, did the company not encourage sort of exploratory research? Not, we were very well disciplined. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was a, there was a lot of pr there was a lot of pressure. Actually, when they first started, you know, they didn't they had no processes, no nothing of their own. So they it was started out as art, as a development and then became commercial. They actually had bets on, you know, can you make a, can you make a, um, a, a CMOS dot or, a, or not a CMOS, but a, um, a, 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 
a metal oxide semiconductor capacitor that doesn't have any drift or contamination? Can you make a clean junction? Can you make a, you know, can you deposit stuff? And they actually had bets between the upper management and the, and the other people. So had a little bit of fun with it, but no, there was no, <laughs> there was no off the reservation sort of development at that point in time. Later on there probably, I mean there probably is, you'd play with stuff. I mean Intel invented the uh, EEPROM, which you know basically is a, is an MOS device with a with a, a, an isolated gate that you can you know program with static electricity, and it'll hold you know it'll hold its charge for or long enough to make a good memory. So obviously somebody had to go off and play with something else to do that. Um, I don't know whether you've heard about Oshinsky diodes or whatever, but I actually we made fiddled with those a little bit to try and do something. More questions? There's one down here. By the way, I, I'm not seeing very well, so if you're further back... Uh, Well, it, it was, uh, but you know, the question, yeah, sorry. The question was, we, it looked like we had a lot of new people coming right out of college, and how did we, how did we um, uh, orient them and make them productive? Um, well, they would go through an orientation. We would explain as, you know, as much as we could do, you know, that you can do in a lecture, but then after that, it was really uh, sort of on-the-job training and close supervision, you know, we would, uh, we would, uh, uh, or may, we might have them work with another person who was an expert at that, take them under persons, give them a mentor or under somebody's wing. But we, we found that people would pretty much go to work right away. I mean, it's like you show up for a new class in a new lab and, you know, they tell you what the assignment is and you, you know, you hop on it. So it's, we, f we found that was the only way we could get the people we need, <laughs> I mean, quite frankly, because otherwise we'd have to hire and recruit from other companies and would, be, would, would really take a lot of different kind of efforts. So we organized ourselves very well to go visit a lot of campuses. We had a, we had a dozen favorite schools and then some others, and, uh, you know, we would, we would um, work that pretty hard, and, and you know, that would give us, uh, that would give us our, our, our people. Anything else? Yes, back there in the back. The, um, the, the two questions. First, we've yes. talked a lot about respect. Yes. And um, having worked with some technology companies, uh, you see sometimes what the respect is very significant from one company to the next. It's not be partially inaccurate, but I'd say if you were to go back 10 years ago. Go back 10 years ago to the Microsoft Corporation, what's respected was raw intellect. You were smart or not smart. You were super smart, smart, not smart. <laughs> and, and you were respected by those categories. So I remember being, I was in, in, introduced to somebody who was, it's okay, he's smart enough. And, the, and so that they, they could then deal with me as a human being. Um, <laughs> and a company like the Boeing Company, which is a very different type of technology, the issue there was sort of, do you get things done, tasked? When somebody says they're going to do something, do they get that done? So I'm kind of curious, one, about how the notion of respect was built up and how was it manifested in your company. And then the second question, which is sort of somewhat non-related, is in, when you were learning an awful lot of quality control uh, stuff, which was originally developed in this country, was then shifted to, to Japan. And the, a lot of U.S. firms studied Japanese management techniques. Quality control is quite fundamental to the, you know, the growth and success of your company. I'm wondering how your notions evolved and whether you studied foreign companies or largely developed them yourselves. Okay. A few questions. Let's let's see. How how were you respected at Intel? One of, probably one of the things that I did was this is something I didn't tell you about. But I at in the legal department, I it had grown rapidly. A lot of times lawyers to lawyers don't have um, you know uh, they they have win lose transactions a lot of times, and um, they didn't treat each other very nicely, and they didn't treat their subordinates very well either. A lot of them would have their secretary print their emails and. Um, then they'd write the answers, and they expected them to type them back. I mean, this kind of thing. And uh, so I actually ran a group which was to sort of clean this up. I took some people from all levels. One of our output devices was an Intel legal team 
golden ruler. And we're talking about this stuff, and we so, from a respect standpoint, I said, you know, it's, I don't want to make this too religious, but it sounds like the golden rule might be just exactly what we need. Let's think about that. And we came up with the idea, you know, don't ask somebody to do something. If you could do the task quicker than you could, it takes you to tell them to do that. Things like this. Other people's work is as is, is, is important to them as your work is to you. You know, really just kind of take a holistic view of this. Now, in terms of intelligent, we like smart people, and we certainly had our share, but I think uh, people that got stuff done were probably, like Boeing Company, as you pointed out, were, were um, um, more revered. And then prompt me on your last question was... Quality control. Oh, quality. How do we get to quality control? For us... Um, we had we had some people who survived a Minuteman fiasco, which was one where you didn't have good metal coverage over sharp oxide edges. And um, the guy that I shared an office with knew that very well and told me what to look for, so we could fix that with scanning electron microscopes. Our ish, our biggest issue was tended to be reliability as opposed to incoming quality. And that may have been how we got into trouble with this Hewlett-Packard report about how the Japanese had done better. Um, anyway, and, and we, I think there are a couple places where we lost our way, especially on logic circuitry. We said, well, we throw it up there, and if it works and it's okay and the customer thinks it's okay, ship it. Um, but as, as time went on, we found out that <coughs> wouldn't work, and it, and it happened really with this Hewlett-Packard report about DRAMs, American versus Japanese. And um, so we started, we actually, we did this ourselves. We studied Japan and um, we uh, uh, looked at those things. And this is, this is the quality part. This is not the reliability. This is sort of the infant mortality or the stuff, not even the infant mortality, but the stuff that comes in that really doesn't meet spec. And we got much more rigorous about this and we learned the things that they did and the Plan Do Check Act. And I actually ended up participating a couple of times in, um, actually writing up a Deming, um, uh, uh, you know, proposal or a, a proposal for our own quality award in the United States. And, uh, and we learned a lot of good things. We actually traveled to Japan, visited some companies, saw what they did. And uh, the Japanese got very good as refine, uh, at refining. I mean, if I remember as a kid, you know, the joke was the quality of the Japanese products were terrible. And then by the time we get to the middle of this, we find out that they're the best on the earth. And there is this, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard about the Deming Prize in Japan. And um, uh, he's somebody who got there after the war, helped them rebuild their country, and taught them how to <laughs> refine and refine and refine and refine and, and, and drive the, the quality ethic in Japan. Ted Jenkins. There's a, there's, actually, yeah, there's a couple back. I'll take another. Um, as it happens, you know, people will inevitably get bored or alienated or, you know, whatever with the company. Mm -hmm. and how much of an effort do you make to reintegrate them into the company's values and the work ethic and the integrity that you're trying to put forward in the product before you got to just kind of cut your losses? Yeah, actually, um, we sort of found that out. I didn't talk about it in here, but it's a good point. I think you, I think you have to reinvent yourself about every five years. You know, if you, uh, and, and a lot of us did, and the, the, quite frankly, that's the nice thing about a large company that has a wide variety of activities. Um, you know, I started in Wafer Fab. I ended up going to the back end processing. I ended up becoming a general manager of some of those divisions, and then I ended up doing patent licensing at the end of my career. And the, the problem is, if you don't reinvent yourself, if you don't do something new periodically, you cannot attack those problems, those same problems that you had on day one on year 10 with the same level of vigor. You know, it's just, you just can't do it. So, um, you know, you're doing yourself uh, um, a disservice if you just sit there. Now, there are some people that have effective careers doing the same thing all their lives. I couldn't do it, and I, and I can see some value in, in, uh, in changing and going elsewhere. So, and we would, we would, um, Actually, the finance, our finance department was particularly aggressive in terms of moving people around. They would actually just reassign them. And, and uh, you know, with that dynamic, they were able to very easily identify the strongest people. And, and they kept all their people interested that way. It was, was, uh, was, they were an example for us in that regard. 
Ted uh, Jenkins, thanks for joining us from Sacramento today. Thank you. Enjoyed it.